All right. Yeah. Okay, we're going to start the next session really soon since we have a little bit less time. We're already five minutes over. So if you are joining us, please sit down. And if you're not, please exit. Hi, MD, are you there? Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Okay, I can hear great. You. I, will, I will just uh, be uh, sharing the slides from this end, if, that, if that's okay, or do you prefer to do it yourself? I would prefer to do it myself. Okay. Um, yeah. I believe we can, she can um, present her slides, yeah. Um, okay, thanks all for joining. Um, oh, hi. Um, thanks all for joining. Uh, my name is Brian O'Donnell. Um, when I'm not a outreach nurse, I'm also on the DHIS2 implementation team. Uh, I work on uh, producing implementation toolkits, including uh, thinking about how DHIS2 implementation should approach non-communicable diseases. Um, for those of you who may be new to the subject, um, I'll just give a, a very brief, very uh, brief background on uh, on NCDs. Um, because uh, DHIS implementations have traditionally been focusing on communicable and infectious diseases, and the majority of our investments over the last uh, 20 to 30 years have been in that area. But as the burden of disease has increasingly shifted towards non-communicable diseases such as uh, diabetes, hypertension, and cancers in DHIS2 countries, we are now starting to think about how DHIS2 implementation should be approaching this topic. So we have three very exciting uh, speakers here today with us, um, or three different uh, presentations rather, um, and four different speakers. Um, first from um, from Blue Square and Expertise uh, France, uh, we'll be presenting on DHIS2 tracker for large scale cervical cancer prevention and treatment in Burkina Faso. Um, and we have a uh, speaker starting here, uh, uh Nandia, can you share your slides? Share your screen. Yes. Okay. I'm okay. Um, okay. As soon as you are ready, you may take the wheel. So, can you see my slides? Not yet. Not yet. Wow. Sorry. Uh, maybe it's behind. Yeah, here. Um, the zoom has to go. Yeah. Zoom on this. One. Yeah. Are you sharing your screen? I'm sharing it. Are we? Oh, there we are. Maybe it is. Zoom ratio. How do I move this over? Because it's not. <laughs> It's on one side. Okay, you can see the slides on the recording, but you cannot see it on the presentation yeah. window. So we are just trying to change the presentation window here. Oh. One second with the uh, technical issues. Okay. Sorry, Namdia, we're going to share your slides from here as we're having some issues with the presentation. Okay, no, no, not a problem at all. So I'll stop sharing and then. Okay, I'll... thank you. Hello. Even this is going to be. Are we just completely frozen now? Oh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Um, it's parallel sessions right there. 
here. Uh, it's just here. Yeah. And that's just another one. Uh, that's another one. Okay. 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 Which one is it? It's one. Just a, this one? Yeah, this, yeah. yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, slideshow. Okay. I hope you can take it from here. Are we are we unmuted? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How do you want this? MD, the floor is yours. Okay, <laughs> thanks everyone, and and sorry for this uh, being late with this with the presentation. And I'm very glad to be presenting our major work with ZHS2 tracker for cervical cancer prevention. Next, so I'll be presenting um, with um, Apollinaire, and I'm an MDR, I'm the MNE lead for um, the Success Project, working at Expertise France, and Apollinaire was the country lead for Blue Square. So the Success Project is um, secondary prevention, um, um, cervical cancer secondary prevention project. Um, deployed in Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Guatemala, and the Philippines. And the idea was to be able to screen 175 women um, with 40% um, living with HIV. Um, through this project, we want to implement, we wanted to implement the DHIS2 tracker. So the project is led by a consortium um, um, led by Expertise Friends and with two major um, partners, JPAIGO, um, who is the, the implementation lead, and UICC more related to the advocacy work we're working. So we also receive uh, heavily support, technical support from WHO and also um, the NCIs um, from four different countries. The project is um, funded and supported by Unit 8. Next. So as I said, it's a, it's a cervical cancer elimination project um, with four major outputs. But the one that is more related to us for this presentation today is output three, where we want to um, implement a service delivery, um, integrated service delivery model um, for screening and linkage to treatment in four different um, contexts. Um, and to do so, we wanted to have a digital tool um, to optimize, I would say, the, the service delivery intervention. Next. So um, although we implemented the project in four countries, we did implement the DHIS2 tracker in Cote d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso, but today the focus will be on Burkina Faso where it's most advanced and in the following slide, you will see why. So can we go next, please? Yeah. Um, in, um, there was also a global momentum to, for implementing the, the, the tracker. Um, recently, um, we were part of the technical working group where um, WHO really had the focus on how to um, collect facility-based um, data for non-communicable disease. And one of the, the conclusion was that it was it, it's really recommended to implement some simple digital tools for um, recording, reporting indicators, but also for patient monitoring. Next. So how we did for the DHIS2 tracker, we had a um, um, methodology. Um, Maybe can we go back to the first the slide before, sorry, before that global momentum? Yes, so we implemented the tracker in, in Burkina Faso in a very um, a specific context. So prior to 2021, um, the, the Ministry of Health did not um, collect routinely um, data on cervical cancer screening and treatment. 
But um, with the intervention of the, the Success Project in January 2021, we were able to, to, to help the Ministry of Health to collect um, facility-based indicator, but on paper-based tool that we updated with JAPAIGO support. Um, and, and also, when we were implementing the project, we quickly realized that paper-based could not really help us to track longitudinally um, the clients, um, um, given the, the, the algorithm we have for cervical cancer, secondary prevention. So in response to that, we, in collaboration with the, the, the Ministry of Health, we introduced the DHIS2 tracker for two main reasons. First of all, the DHIS2 aggregate is used in Burkina Faso as the national HMIS, so the interoperability and the, sh the, the indicator sharing would be easier for us. And second, the tracker um, was fully de deployed for COVID and it was piloted in for HIV and TB cases um, tracking. So, so, so in Burkina Faso, then, so next. So we started with this methodology. We, 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 we conduct a, a very heavy um, analysis of existing data system because the key word of the success project is integration, but also sustainability. So we wanted that the tool we wanted to introduce leave um, uh, and, and remains after um, the project. So that's why we conducted this um, 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 analysis. And then with the support, um, we support the MOH to update all the, the registers, the tools, and the HMIS indicators related to cervical cancer um, secondary prevention. We digitized the WHO clinical algorithm re re related to um, our intervention. And we analyzed, uh, we, we, we conduct a platform analysis with the signed it, and we created metadata dictionary. We set up um, the tool um, on DHIS2 capture. We set up also the, 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 the SMS server and the mess messages to be sent out with the, the tool. We conducted a pilot phase really to get the, the end user's feedback and to be able to correct um, the tool as needed. And we did the deployment while integrating the tracker in the MOH existing environment. And all along the, the step, we, we deployed also change management really to inform um, to enforce um, the ownership um, at different levels for, for the tool, from the laboratory technicians, service provider to um, the, the, the central MOH unit. And we continue to engage women. So the way it works, patient or enrolled. And, and, and then we, we do the screening and lab analysis through different forms. We do result sharing by connecting the SMS server with the DHIS2. And then we do um, the treatment and follow up to treatment. Next, please. So this is a clinical algorithm and you can see how complicated it could be, it can be um, even on paper based to do patient monitoring and follow up. So um, that's why we, 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 we came up with the tracker, as I said, thanks. So how it works, the tracker is used in the health center, but also at the lab level, because we are doing HPV DNA testing, and that's not done um, at the same place than um, um, you know patient consultation and treatment. So we have the samples. The patient they come first for self screening, self um, or provided uh, assist providers assisted um, 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 sampling, and then the samples go. Um, to to the lab where they are analyzed. So we we came up with a with a with a tracker app that allows for communication between the lab technicians and the the the, the service provider at the sites. And then all the data entered are um, in the DHIS2 instance, and they are used to create dashboards that help for decision making and patient tracking. So different dashboards were also created um, based on the, the, the end user's need 
um, the lab dashboards is not the same as the, the, the service provider um, dashboard, and it's not either the same as, as the district level dashboard or the, the MOH um, dashboard where data are more and more aggregated. And the DHIS2 instance is connected to an SMS server that sent um, SMS to the patient um, related to the results availability, but also upcoming appointments. Next. So we have different forms, um, but we need to um, focus also on what the DHIS2 now can do. The DHIS2 tracker we have for cervical cancer secondary prevention allows for um, tracking the patient throughout the biopsy result, but it ends at the biopsy result. Um, we, it, it is not a cancer case tracking, um, but we, um, Apolina will, will, will tell, but we want to go further with the tool we deployed in Burkina Faso. Next, please. So this is one of the output of the data collected. This um, dashboard is used more at the central level, but also at the program, um, national program um, level, where we can um, sh show the cascade um, of care. For, for the secondary prevention and also the screening throughout the time. Next. So I'll leave the floor now to Apollinaire. We will bring you through difficulties encountered, but also solutions and lessons learned. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nemdia, for this first presentation. So doing this kind of uh, work, uh, of course, you will meet some difficulties. So I'm going to, to cite some of the difficulties we encountered during this, uh, the implementation of this project. So first of all, it's creating uptake and encouraging buying and use of DHS tracker forms, inconsistent use of the application. So if a patient come like uh, in the local health facility and we don't have two to collect the samples that may affect the inconsistency of use of the applications, Incomplete forms and entry of results into tracker impacted turnouts times and contributing to potential loss to follow up. So inaccurate chronology of events impacting ability to longitudinal track also. Uh, women from screening in screening through the treatment as needed to backload of that entry from influx of current screening during major screening campaigns, you know, in the country. Uh, the project doesn't cover all the countries. So sometimes the Minister of Health tried to do some big campaigns. So at this moment, we have many, many women who are coming to the health facility. So we have an overload of work. Uh, uh, so we have also the migration to the DHS version that was several versions newer, which had a number of bugs and challenges requiring time for technicians to solve. Of course, we found out some solution to fix those issues. So formalizing care pathway for proper configuration in DHH2, joint supportive supervision visit for mentorship on correct and complete use of track application, following initial training also, setting management tools for ensuring the, tech, the chronology of events by linking the sampling form and result form in DHH2 to data quality as incentive for better data collection and also to limit inconsistency. Integration of DHS2 program within the MOH DHS2 infrastructure is also a solution we give to this. So we learn also best practices and it will be good to also share lessons uh, for those who want to implement those kind of uh, work. So first of all is understand the country digital health ecosystem, involve national stakeholders at every step to involve end user in the design and testing phase, align the pilot phase with the site reporting cycle, define a change management strategy and a deployment strategy, integrated supervision with the surveillance data manager at district level. That's very important to allow the district technical manager to solve certain issues and mentor users in monthly reporting. So, uh, since the start, the beginning of the project till the date we submitted the abstract. So we trained more than 200 professionals in the use of tracker. 
So we enrolled more than 30,000 women in the tools, and we sent more than 14,000 SMS to the SMS server, and uh, we expect to have in the database at the end of June more than 40,000 women. So doing this project, uh, you have to also see how you are going to work on the ownership, the sustainability, and also the transition to the Ministry of Health. So to ensure ownership of the platform by the Ministry of Health, we adopt the opt-set for a participatory strategy. So first of one is the selection of the DHS stroker, uh, already in use of the already in use for other pathology in the, in the country. Uh, next is the development of the forms with the NCD department and the HMIS unit of the Ministry of Health. That's very important. Third one is the implementation of the DHH2 track application and dashboards under the lead of the HMIS units. And the uh, next one is to allow you know, so the Ministry of Health Surveillance Server to host the, the platform, including the SMS servers. This is very important to take over the, the process. So, and next, and finally, to make some joint supervision with the Minister of Health. So to conclude, uh, the platform improves patient follow-up at health centers. It's also improved the availability and quality of data for higher level decision-making. So, and we also have some perspectives. So call for DHS2 tracker to be adopted nationwide, warehouse for indicator transfer, potential future use, so setting up interoperability between the surveillance platform and the cancer registry. And uh, all this work is to have these smiling faces of women. Thank you to you. Thanks. Maybe as we're getting the next speaker, Andreas, if he wants to come up. Um, we have some time in between for questions, if anyone has some questions for Apolinera and Mdia. Yes, Rashad. Or maybe you can just project and we can repeat the question. Or what do you want? Oh, we have a microphone. Okay. <laughs> This, yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, the name is Farshad Farzasfar. I am a scientist in the NCD department, WHO headquarters in Geneva. And thank you so much for the presentation. I really enjoyed it and I learned that specifically, I really liked the part that you connected the lab results to the to the other part, which is a, which is a very, very important and very good. The question is, uh, uh, when you are doing the screening, not the treatment, when we don't have, uh, when individuals coming and just for a screening, are you counting the service or are you counting the individuals? And if you are counting the individuals, could be the reason for, because you have to enter a lot of data for each individual, uh, could be one of the reasons that you, the, the facility people getting overwhelmed because of the burden of uh, uh, records. And uh, I think that that would be one part. And also the second question is uh, what you have done is just limited to the primary health care uh, setting or it's uh, also included the secondary and tertiary. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, maybe I can I can come at, come start and, and Apollina put it. Um, what we what we count is the, the patient, not the service. As I said, Looking at the algorithm, we have different type of services that one patient receives throughout um, um, treatment. And for each type of services, we have um, developed a form. So um, when the woman come, it, it, is, it is counted as one patient receiving different types um, of service. And um, we also able to capture the type of service, um, but 
rather than the cervical cancer because as I said, the, the success project is, uh, the key word is integration. So we provide cervical cancer services in HIV clinics, but also in, in, in gynecology services and in, in one site. So we are able also to, to capture where the women is, are receiving this type of cervical cancer secondary prevention services. So the secondary prevention services starts from self-sampling or provided um, assisted sampling um, to follow up after treatment. And uh, we deployed the tracker on 36 sites at different level, but not tertiary level because our um, intervention stop at secondary um, um, prevention. So we are from the primary care to district um, hospital and site and to national um, or university hospital. Thanks. Thanks so much. Another round of applause for Peter. Um, and up next, we have uh, uh, the World Diabetes Foundation's Diabetes Compass will be presenting on the uh, their initiative in Sri Lanka. Uh, Andreas Fisberg is a senior program manager from uh, WDF, and he will be sharing his slides on their work there. Can you share your yes. Okay. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. My name is Jean Paul Hatajikimana from uh Hispi Rwanda. I'm with my colleague uh Mutari Jean Paul. He's a senior soft developer here in Hispi Rwanda. Uh, I hope he is uh on call. Okay. Uh, if, if he is not, he is coming. So um uh, maybe, Blan, can I go on with my presentation? Yes, uh, I don't think that uh, you, we can see your screen from our side, oh. unfortunately. Are you sure that you're sharing? He's sharing. You're sharing, but we yeah. just can't see it. Okay, there we are. Yeah, we still can't see it. Okay, so we will just okay. uh, try to keep aligned with your slides from here then. Yes, we'll okay, okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, our presentation is uh, about the abstract we have submitted, which is about the use of DHIS2 as a digital tool um, to help to track the non-communicable diseases for early case detection and real-time case management here in Rwanda. The use case is here in Rwanda. And uh, for information, the NCD tracker is now in use. So we wanted to share with you how we have collaborated, we have been collaborating with the Ministry of Health to um, implement this NCD tracker. Sorry, we're, we're sharing the slides from our side here. If you can hear us now. Where there's an issue with uh, sharing the slides, so we're doing it from our side. But uh, please proceed. John Paul, are you there? Yes, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Yes, uh, um, we'll just share with you uh, about the details uh, about the implementation of NCD program here in Rwanda. Can you be back a little bit on the agenda? Yeah. Yes, uh, and then we will discuss a little bit about the challenges um, uh, the ministry is facing in the NDC, uh, NCD screening and treatment. Then we will share with you about the digital solutions where we are using the chance to uh, to manage the I mean to manage the NCD cases from the screening up to the treatment, and then we talk a little bit about the system integrations where NCD tracker has to be sharing the information with other rated systems, and then we will share with you some results we are observing, and then some opportunities for collaborations next. Uh, NCD program here in Rwanda is just um, a program 
uh, one of the programs under the Ministry of uh, Health, but the Ministry of Health here in Rwanda has established another institution called Rwanda Biomedical Center, which is a technical entity, which is there just to implement different policies um, put that has been put in place by the ministry. So through that uh, Rwanda Biomedical Center institution, there is a program called um, uh, In Charge of um, NCD, where uh, their priorities are some of the priorities are increasing the awareness in the community about prevention and, and detection, then centralization of the management of NCD from the central level to the district, uh, up to the health centers, but also we have uh, some services at community level. And then establishing disease registries. Here, disease registries, when it comes to NCD, we have national cancer registry, injury registry, diabetes registry, thematic heart disease registry and then promotion of research and development related to NCD. Actually, at this last point, we are collaborating with them to measure the impact of using all these trackers. That's where comes um, this uh, abstract you have submitted. Next. Uh, talking a little bit about the challenges in NCD screening and treatment, there is um, and observe the limited awareness among population about NCD and associated risk factors, where we find that even those who have the access to the health care, they are not really uh, getting these uh, screening services on time. So we found that it's a kind of a lack of awareness. Then home self-check, uh, for those already have this um, kind of um, and CD, even for those who are not yet um, uh, uh, being detected positive, uh, the self-check at home is not is really something which is lacking for blood pressure and glycemia, but mainly here for those already positive. Then the third one is the referral system, which is not adequate for the diabetes and the hypertension. You complication emergencies, you find that. If someone is uh, in emergency condition, when he gets to the hospital or when he gets in emergency condition, we have been observing that uh, for many cases, uh, there is a need to reinforce this referral system. Maybe uh, we are trying to see how the system can help us to improve the referral system. Then the connected community screening, education, and the follow-up, um, of NCD patient was not efficient and um, limited specialized equipment, staff and infrastructure. And we will, we will see how most of the challenges are being uh, mitigated through this digital system. Next. Yes, uh, now uh, NCD digital solution. Uh, you will see you know, on this side uh, where there is um, uh, one of the uh, DHIS2 uh, mobile app where it's being used to track this um, uh, screening um, activities uh, using this mobile app. So uh, in collaboration with the Ministry of Health here in Rwanda, uh, the Ministry has issued the ministerial order of how detecting NCDs through a systematic NCD screening at the community level using the HIS. And then that's where his Rwanda came in, because through the Rwanda Biomedical Center, which is really uh, responsible of implementing all policies, um, we have uh, um, customized a DHIS to based NCD tracker. Uh, for it to be used uh, starting from the NCD screening up to the NCD uh, case management. And um, uh, we are now tracking uh, for NCD uh, screening in Rwanda, the, the eligibility criteria, one of the eligibility criteria is that for all females starting from that five, they, are, they have to have an annual screening annual screening, and then 40 and above for males, they have that uh, annual screening. So we are tracking all those uh, records uh, individually, starting from the uh, screening up to the treatment. For those who are positive, of course, they are uh, put on treatment. And for those who are screened negative, 
their events is stop there. So we have also cancer registry. Also cancer registry is a kind of NCD tracker uh, where we have collaborated with the, uh, the NCD to put in place this cancer registry. And now the cancer registry has um, is integrated with the something called the Kandegi 5. Um, so all these trackers are for NCD um, a digitalization program, but uh, for today, I think we will focus on NCD tracker. Uh, next. Yeah, this is um, a schema that shows how the screening is being done. Uh, you, you will see at community level, we have population which um, are visiting the health center. And at the health center, they do the basic uh, the basic uh, diagnosis screening, and once the screen is positive, the patient is referred to the hospital for further assessment. And once um, the hospital, because the hospital they are the ones which have that mandate of confirming whether a case is positive, uh, NCD positive or not. So after the referral, the hospital once uh, someone is confirmed to be a um, positive NCD case is put under treatment, and after being put under treatment, um, he is allowed in the N N NCD tracker, and after allotment, um, of course there is a diagnosis, allotment, and treatment, and after the treatment, he is sent back to the community for follow-up. This is the allow in green for follow-up, because the follow-up is being done at the health center, which is the lowest uh, health facility level, yeah, next, I got it. Uh, yeah, this is one of the pictures that has been taken during the screening activity. Next, uh, this is one of the screenshots taken from the system. The, on the other side, you will see the dashboards. Yeah, and this is about the system integration. Some of the systems we that has been integrated just to enable this um, the management of ND, uh, NCD uh, records. We have um, yeah, we have we, we have integrated the national identification um, with um, CLRVS and vital statistics and uh, HMIS, which is lutein immunization. I mean lutein information management. So we are tracking to enable data translation so that um, we can uh, easily be able to analyze and talk with um, this NCD tracker. Then about the results, NCD tracker is assisting clinicians to minimize errors by pro uh, providing outcomes, actions to be taken. Cause after uh, maybe to, to explain a little bit about this, how then uh, NCD tracker is helping clinicians to minimize errors by uh, providing outcome and taking decision. When um, a case is screened for NCD, the, there is program, different program nodes that are there to help the clinician to decide whether this screening, screen case is positive or negative. Automatically, the system will uh, have a kind of um, decisions where clinician can base on and maybe decide. It will not replace clinicians, but it is helping assisting clinicians to decide. Then, it's a digital solution that enables follow up or positive cases. You see, it helps a linkage, but also retention. Then, come check up is annual. This is a kind of information. Uh, we are just giving clients identification with the unique code. The system has a unique code, and this is eliminating the cost for screening. You know, sometimes when you don't have a kind of identifying, the assigning unique codes, uh, you will end up by screening one case more than one time once a year. Yet by policy, and everyone should be screened at least once per year. So clients identification by using unique code is something good. Number of clients now, within this fiscal year 2022 2023 there are now more than two million five hundred uh, I mean two two million five hundred thousand this number is above 85 percent of the targeted annual targets or population to be screened you see that now using the system 
we are able to monitor uh, the progress towards the targets, but also uh, this will help us also to find this uh, remaining 15% remaining to be screened. This is one of the results by using this NCD tracker. Next. Yeah, this map shows uh, the coverages of NCD um, tracker. Uh, it's one of the dashboards we have developed, where which is helping the program to monitor the, the screen cases towards the target. They have annual target, they have monthly targets. Then the opportunities for collaboration, there are different opportunities um, remaining and available for collaboration. We think that one and see the experiences we inform the global standard test two packages. Uh, in fact, we are uh, this, uh, this um, uh, in collaboration with the University of Oslo, the, uh, the NCD package is uh, um, one of the things, and I think they, they got the information or some of the information from the Rwanda experience, NCD implementation. Yeah, then I'm wrapping up. Then the expansion of the NCD screening and diagnosis case surveillance, there's a linkage to secondary care and the routine monitoring, study use of um NCD data from the test two systems at a national and national level. Of course, there are different studies that are uh, ongoing using this um uh NCD tracker and CD data, and I think there are different opportunities for different researchers that uh, are ongoing and that, that would be starting soon using this data. And um, all these are the opportunities allowed. We think that uh, there will be based on this the implementation of this uh, SCD tracker. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, a summary of what we would like to share with you about the implementation of the NCD track in Rwanda. I think I can stop by here and uh, we'll, I will welcome your comments, your input. I don't know whether Mutar is on the call so that he can maybe um, provide some uh, compliments if uh, I may be forgetting something. Over to you. Thank you so much, John Paul. Um, we are running low on time, so I'm going to ask that we can move directly into our next uh, presentation here. But I do also just want to quickly point out the scale of this system for NCD screening. A lot of times people think that these are pilot projects or sentinel surveillance. They've managed to screen 85% of their target population over the course of one fiscal year, which I think is a really remarkable achievement and should be um, should be noticed more of across the DHIS2 community. So well done to your entire team on that. Um, can we have a big round of applause for them? Yeah. Um, Andres, could you? Well, I think you introduced me before. Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Previously known, not known as. But hello, my name is Andreas. I'm from um, the World Diabetes Foundation. Uh, we're physically located in Denmark. That's the headquarters. But um, we we do a lot of work across the world, and we have uh, a few regional representatives. Um, and I have the pleasure of how do I switch the slides? I just press the keyboard. Okay, good. And thank you so much for the invitation uh, to come speak today. And uh, I consider myself a bit of a prelude today in the sense that uh, we have some of our partners locally. We have some of our partners present here. We have uh, our partners from the Ministry of Health um, in Sri Lanka, uh, Health Information Unit. So I'm very happy. Maybe you can raise your hand so we can see where you are. <laughs> um, and uh, also we work, of course, closely with the HISP. So yeah, a prelude in the sense that I hope next year, because we're still in the uh, development and implementation phase that next year, hopefully, uh, we can invite some of all you to the stage instead of me. Um, but let me get on with it. Uh, so we at the World Diabetes Foundation have been busy implementing a program called the Diabetes Compass Program, which uh, with all these fancy words uh, express that we are in a process of um, of seeing how we can reduce vulnerabilities in not only the diabetes, but also the hypertension care pathway by developing innovative digital solutions. Uh, and in this process, we support digital transformation of health systems towards an integrated and patient-centric approach 
to healthcare service delivery. I think it's uh, very academic, so I'll try to break it down uh, and give you a bit of more of a practical idea of what we do. Um, I think what we've learned so far, since uh, we're still a bit new in the World Diabetes Foundation, which is 20 years old, as a foundation doing a lot of uh, health programs around the world, we're still a bit new in digital health, uh, and, and we have launched this Diabetes Compass program as an effort to try and see how we can work not only within the space of diabetes and hypertension care, but how can we leverage technology into this space? Uh, and then we have this program where what we've learned so far is that we have encountered that a lot of health systems um, introduce individual digital technologies. And therefore, we have now, together with our partners in Sri Lanka, uh, Tanzania and Malawi, discovered that we, uh, are, we are focusing more on uh, on support uh, yeah, at the transformation of uh, uh, of the health system, uh, leveraging technologies to do so. And let me see here. Um, what we what we really encountered in Sri Lanka uh, was that uh, they were in the process of developing a, a large digital health blueprint. Uh, and so our um, our own conception of trying to come there and introducing technologies. Uh, you can say met a bit of not resistance, but uh, it it met a, a really high requirement to align with the current technologies and strategies of the country and this blueprint. Um, and yeah, I would love to have invited if we had more time, Dr. Polita, um, the director of the Health Information Unit, to talk more about this because this became pivotal for our work, as opposed to coming in with a preconceived and 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 predetermined technology. Uh, we underwent a, a quite long process um, of aligning with their digital health blueprint, which which was really emphasizing the digitization, the connection and the sharing, uh, interoperability uh, of the health um, information systems landscape. So we undertook a lot of co-creation and collaborative act activities uh, in country, in the three countries where we're implementing the Diabetes Compass program. Um, and we have uh, different, uh, you can say, product tracks in our program. One of them is called Health Information. So we underwent this uh, oh, underwent these activities um, and and around four uh, pro, uh, problem areas: surveillance, quality, uh, resourcing, and con continuity. How can you use health information across those four uh, areas uh, to innovate and and create uh, solutions? Uh, so that then expanded more. Uh, it expanded further into a. Uh, a solution design phase, uh, and here we're working again with some of our partners. There's a beautiful photo of you, Dr. Palitza, presenting the digital health blueprint uh, at the top left corner. Um, and and all in all, we we kind of we converted and translated all that into uh, into into um, into a journey uh, of how data flows from the community to the to the outer right, which is the data use. So. Basically, what we've been able to do is to, together with our stakeholders in Sri Lanka, Ministry of Health, Health Information Unit, NCD Unit, is to conceive um, this vision or this concept where we start from a community data capture um, point of view or uh, use case uh, where we're developing an app. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, that app then connects, uh, it screens individuals at the community level uh, using um, a risk calculation algorithm. Uh, we can refer them to to a more comprehensive screening at a facility where they're then, if if screened uh, positive for diagnosis hypertension, enrolled into clinic treatment. Um, we then work more from a health data surveillance point of view uh, in aggregating the data uh, and ultimately focusing on data use with the relevant stakeholders across national, subnational, and facility level. Um, and as you can see at the bottom here, then there are different technical or technology technology components involved in each of these different visionary steps or concept steps um so when we so if i if i try to relate this back to to where we all where we all started um this was a lot of of collaboration and co-creation um we had this like high level concepts that we eventually turned into a solution map uh which looks like this and now it gets much more technical so what you saw from the beginning were all these more conceptual steps, which is ending up with this. And this is now what we have the pleasure of working on together with the Ministry of Health in Sri Lanka. Uh, we're, a bit, we're pretty far now, I feel. Uh, and I think it being a DHIS2 conference, uh, what's interesting to bring out uh, here in this, in this room is, is probably that uh, we did not go for a tracker implementation. And that was a quite deliberate move uh, together with the HISP Sri Lanka and Ministry of Health. 
we opted instead for um, the uh, the, rac- the raccoon in the middle that's on fire, uh, which probably all of you people know here. Um, but we opted for a fire server implementation or a happy fire. In this case, the happy fire server implementation. And if I had more time and if this was a more technical discussion, we could go into depth about what, what, is, the, what is the prospect of that. But I think it, it's tied on one side to the fact that the community screening platform or the community health platform called OpenSRP um, has a strong connection to a fire server. Uh, but I think more importantly, um, it's really it's to speak the language of interoperability uh, and that as we come into this and try to collaborate with the Ministry of Health, um, we want to we want to, of course, as everybody else wants to um, adopt uh, and implement a sustainable and long term model, um, a model that then or a solution architecture that 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 centers around interoperability and supports their existing concept for a national e-health record. Um, was we was what we ultimately decided to try and do, uh, and that's what we're now in the process of doing. So, a lot of capacitation around uh, fire modeling uh, uh, in this whole solution architecture, and we're just at the moment now getting to the interesting part of interest, uh, integrating the fire server with DHGIS two uh, and aggregating data, uh, and that's also uh, becoming a really interesting challenge, um, very solvable challenge, uh, but also interesting. Um, so, what we learned in this process is that. I don't know if this speaks specific to Sri Lanka, but we've definitely felt that planning and progressing in a dynamic social political environment has been challenging, um, as well as as navigating uh, uh, an increasingly complex stakeholder network. I think to put some words to that is that I think it surprised us as WDF. We have historically mostly worked with the NCD units of a, of a, of a particular country. And in order for our program, being also a technology program, to become sustainable, we had to engage in very, very high collaboration with the health information unit or the tech side of the Ministry of Health. Uh, and now we are also faced with yet another ministerial partner. So we're actually, we're, we're, we have the pleasure of doing a lot of cross-ministerial collaboration um, and implementation. Um, it also was interesting for us to uh, experience the requirements to aligning with and understanding the existing uh, digital roadmaps and policies of the country which has also now proven as we go into solution development and implementation to be highly advantageous. So Sri Lanka has already undertaken a lot of really, really great efforts in drafting fire models and defining guidelines for data sharing and interoperability. So I think as a program that has high ambitions in terms of solution development, um, this was a great thing to be exposed to. It was also uh, a strong require, it was quite challenging. We've also experienced, as I think was with anyone else in this room who's been dealing with implementations, that there's been a converging with other uh, other digital health solutions being implemented. Um, but luckily so far, it's gone okay. Um, and then our own ambition of not trying to build a massive local office has also been a requirement because, as everyone knows, uh, tech projects, they can quickly get out of hand. So you want to increase your capacity and and, and staff up, uh, but I think the more you do that, the more you also um, you're also facing a risk of of uh, of not being able, not not creating a sustainable um, um, and long term strategy. Um, yeah, just as a rounding off slide, uh, maybe just interesting for people to know that through this whole process and 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 where we're heading, um, what we've learned so far, and what informs our own digital health framework. So we focus on needs based innovation, not products. Uh, we want to improve. I think especially the things around improving and integrating has been a key thing for us. Um, we never really wanted to, we don't have our own solutions at WDF. Um, we deliberately promote everything as open source and yeah, basically use them, the, the principles of, of digital uh, adoptions. Um, and I think fire is becoming a very key thing in our framework. Um, because it enables us to establish a whole different dialogue with our partners uh, when we go somewhere. And I think it's also a lot of countries are in this verge now. They need to figure out what that strategy is from a digital transformation point of view in the health systems. So I think that's really interesting. Of course, digital public goods. Um, yeah. And then can we just keep supporting local development and capacity building uh, throughout this uh, in the countries where we are? So, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Just trying to. Keep the pace high. There was a slide that says thank you. (laughs) Thank you very much, everyone.